get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs and leaders. And I always, so sometimes Pete, I mess up the intro and I keep going because that's the real deal. <laughs> Even my name or my company's name. So um, I'm excited to have Pete Cunningham on uh, Valve Healthcare Marketing. I'm gonna formally introduce him in a second. But uh, before I do, I always like to point out past episodes that are interesting. You know, our mutual friends, Pete, uh, Duncan Elney, uh, he's got an amazing agency. So check out the episode we did together. Jason Swank, uh, we were hanging out, even though we live very close together uh, from each other and even play morning basketball sometimes. Pete has a sweet jump shot, by the way. Uh, we hung out in Durango and check out the episode I did with Jason Swank. Um, he talks about how they're actually acquiring agencies and what they're doing there. And also a little bit about what he did to grow his agency and Ian Garlic as well. That and many more on inspiredinsider.com. Um, and this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, you know, basically we help businesses give to and connect to their dream relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And you know, if you've listened to this podcast before, and Pete and I know each other a little bit, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way to do that than to profile the people and companies I admire over the last 10 years I've been doing this on my podcast to shout from the rooftops what they're doing and how they're doing it. So other people can learn from them as well. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com and learn more. And I have Pete Cunningham here. He is the founder and CEO of Chicago-based Evolve Healthcare Marketing. And the company specializes in helping medical practices and healthcare enterprises profitably grow in highly competitive markets throughout the US. And prior to Evolve, he found and exited a public relations firm, built a real estate investment firm, specializing in affordable housing in Chicago, as well as worked in private equity. He's also the publisher of the American Healthcare Journal. Pete, thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you. I think I get tongue tied with you. It's like, maybe it's because we <laughs> play basketball together. Um, yeah. But I want you to start with uh, a little about your company and what you do. Sure. Um, so Evolve uh, actually began as a management consulting firm about 10 years ago, um, where I would be hired to be an outsourced chief marketing officer for oftentimes private equity backed healthcare businesses. And at the time, it had started really on the business to business side. So companies like that were doing anesthesia, emergency medicine, radiology, trying to get more contracts with hospitals. Um, and then we pivoted uh, about four years ago because we were doing more on the B2C side, meaning helping larger practices get more patients faster, better, cheaper, leveraging technology and the latest digital platforms to do so. And so we pivoted a bit and changed our name to Evolve Healthcare Marketing uh, to be a little bit more reflective of the digital agency that we be became from our management consulting roots. There's a huge yeah. need for that. I mean, if you look at any medical practice, I mean, that's what they want and need to do. Correct. So, you know, we serve two distinct segments within healthcare. We're, we're, we do not work in pharma or medical device, which a lot of people think of when they think of healthcare. Um, we specifically work with typically larger physician practices and ancillary services to help them get more patients better, faster, cheaper. Um, and then our, our what we originally began with, which is business to business, helping service and technology providers sell into the provider community. And a big driver on all of this on both sides is the enormous amount of private equity investment that's been happening in, in the industry for the last 10 years. Uh, the, I think the latest stat I saw was that there's about a 1.3 trillion and private equity capital that is directed towards industry consolidation and, and that type of thing. And so we're right in the middle of it all. Wow. There's always something I feel like crazy going in healthcare, right? And 
I'd love for you to talk about the impact now, and we could talk, you know, B2B or the B2C sector, but some of the impact and maybe start with the B2C sector, what's happening now with that? Sure. Um, so obviously COVID impacted, you know, everybody individually, collectively, professionally, personally, so forth. Um, so a number of, from our vantage point in healthcare, a number of things have occurred and are occurring. Um, so during COVID on the B2C front, so practices, hospitals, so forth, elective surgeries were, were um, paused. And that's a big problem, particularly in, in hospitals, as a, the OR oftentimes represents about 90% of the profit for a hospital. So that puts a lot of financial strain on the hospitals and health systems, and obviously the, the physician practices and, and so forth. Um, so now fast forward through the various <laughs> variants and things we have going on, you know, people are wanting their knee replacements now. Doctors want to do those knee replacements, but the impact now is actually the, um, the shortage of labor. So I was talking to a friend the other day who's the CEO of a large GI practice in the Northeast, and um, he's going nuts. <laughs> he, went, he, had, he, sent, he sent an email that was just a bit of a tirade when I asked him how things were going because he can't, you know, it's not the doctors want to do the, you know, the patients want the service, the doctors want to do the service, um, but it's the people behind the scenes that are answering the phones, uh, cleaning the technicians and so forth that there's just a shortage of labor. And so they're having a real challenge um, recruiting and retaining those people. And um, so that's a big issue there on the B2C side. Um, and then on the B2B, um, what's interesting about that is there's uh, a lot of the conferences and trade shows obviously were shut down. Um, some of them are coming back, but they're, you know, uh, not what they were. And, uh, so that's forcing a lot of B2B companies and of course, in-person meetings, you can't, you know, just pop in at a practice or hospital anymore. Those in-person meetings have been shut down. So, uh, they need to start going digital and, um, in terms of being able to, systematically engage decision makers to generate leads and support sales teams. And you've been doing this digital thing for many years. So what are some of the, what's some of the advice? And they're probably turning to you for advice on some of this, because this is new territory. Um, what's some of the advice you've had to give people as far as going digital or the digital realm? So, yeah, good question. Uh, so on the B2B side, um, Traditionally, you know, healthcare, you know, we joke that uh, healthcare is behind in best practices of many industries. And we joke that even on its best day, it's about 20 years behind best practices. So if you think of like um, technology companies, you know, um, they're far more advanced, you know, in their demand generation, lead generation, sales processes, and everything. And then you have healthcare you know, which is kind of way on the other side spectrum. Um, so a lot of healthcare companies have not, you know, have not realized that the buyer's journey changed long before COVID came. That today, you know, it's estimated that about 70% of a sales process is actually done online before they even reach out to a salesperson or agree to a meeting. And so uh, COVID, no COVID, the reality is the world's changed. And unfortunately, a lot of B2B companies were still doing things the way that they were 15 years ago. And, um, and so COVID just cemented the shift that many of them have had to make. Um, so what we're doing is we're working with a lot of these companies who are going digital for the first time. And um, they have a sales teams that are national that can't go to those conferences and trade shows. Um, if they do, the decision makers aren't there. Um, they're not allowed to just pop in for in-person meetings. 
um, but they need those leads to be able to hit the numbers. And then you throw in private equity that's investing money in these businesses. They have expectations for growth, profitability. Um, so that's that's what's been happening. So walk me through, I think this would be instructive for any company. Um, <clears throat> talk about the buyer's journey. So, you know, the old school way, now the new school way. What When you're on the phone with one of these you know, facilities, what are you telling them as far as here's what the customer journey actually looks like? And here's some of the things you should be doing. Sure. Uh, do we want to start on B2C? Yeah. Switch to B2C? Sure. sure. Okay. So on the B2C side, um, and what I referred to on the, the 70% was on the B2B side, but on the B2C side, so folks that are looking for a physician practice or service. So traditionally, we, we break it down into source, evaluate, and choose. So if someone, if a primary care doctor diagnoses that I need a knee replacement, for example, or any other procedure, oftentimes they're going to refer me to uh, a specialist in their network, part of their health system oftentimes, um, or to an independent practitioner, what have, whatever the case may be. And traditionally, folks would just go with whoever the doctor referred. Um, or, you know, a family member said, oh, uh, Dr. So-and-so did a great job for me. So referrals oftentimes was a majority of how patients flowed into a practice. That changed over the last 10 years, where patient choice, the whole idea of consumerism of healthcare, has really risen. And with the advent of the internet, um, the, the latest stat, I think, is that one in 20 Google searches is healthcare related, just to give you perspective. So today, and that idea of source, evaluate, and choose, I'm going to, sure, I'll take that referral, but I'm going to be going online and checking out that, that practice and that physician. I'm going to be looking at Googling best knee surgeon near me, best knee surgeon Chicago, whatever those searches happen to be. I'm going to be looking at reviews. And so the source part of it is the practices need to pop up when they're doing, people are actively doing those researches. Um, the second part is the evaluate is, does their website have content to support the decision making? Um, do they have reviews on Google, Vitals, Health Grades? And are those reviews, are, are they above four stars? Because if they're not, that's a real challenge. And do they have more than 30 reviews or is it nine reviews at a 3.7% you know, uh, star rating? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily want to go to a doctor that has a 3.7 star rating, right? So, and then ultimately, source, evaluate, choose, how easy is it to get in? So uh, for years, uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America really ate the lunch of a lot of health systems in oncology. And when you look at their billboards, oftentimes the call to action is talk to an oncology specialist today or within 24 hours. Trying to get in with someone at typical health systems, it can take months to get in, which is the last thing you want to hear when you've been diagnosed with cancer. So those are the things that we're assessing and helping to improve you know, um, throughout that journey for those practices is that source, evaluate, and choose. Um, you know, so that, that, those are the things that we're working on with them. I want to talk about that, the easy to get in part. <clears throat> part of me thinks, yeah, I mean, as a patient, I want to call and get in. And part of you thinks, well, is it social proof? If they're like, well, there's a really long wait because that means they're really busy and they're really good. So how do you, and maybe that doesn't matter. I'm just curious your opinion on that. It's the same thing with a restaurant. Like, I want to go to this restaurant. It looks good, but then you go in and it's it's there's a wait. There's some kind of social proof there that it's great. 
So Mm -hmm. how do you balance or how do you think about balancing that? Yeah. Get in today. And then the back of my mind, subconsciously or subconsciously, I'm thinking maybe they're not that good if I can get in the same day. Sure. So I I think it's a great, great question. So going back to that source of I weight choose, right? So the source being findable, right? So the evaluate, so building of websites that have a lot of content. So for example, on oncology, if I have bile duct cancer, does the website have information about bile duct cancer? You know, that would make me warm, feel warm and comfy versus just a bullet point as something that they do or just general. Oh, sure, we treat cancer. Um, and then, and there's a, when they talk about the buyer's journey, there it is, it's a process. But by the time they get to, okay, do they take my insurance? Um, and then can I get in? It goes back to that dysfunction, operational dysfunction that a lot of healthcare has. Um, people get very frustrated because we live, now live in a world where you have Instacart, right? I, I haven't been to actually Costco in years. I just order things on, on Instacart and have it all delivered. Right. So we, that's the world we live in. And so how, why should it be different in terms of healthcare providers? So today from a best practice standpoint, the providers that are really embracing patient engagement, you can schedule appointments with text message, you know, um, schedule everything right online. It's no longer, okay, fill out a bunch of stuff online and then you come you go into the office and they ask you to fill it out again on paper, you know, and those types of that, that friction that oftentimes people uh, associate with medical practices. Um, it's hard. They make it hard to do business with them in yeah. many cases. Yeah. And so, but again, with the consumerism of healthcare, they've got to make it easy. So like there's a company called one medical um, that I, th- I believe Google's an investor in. And they, they have offices here in Chicago and other markets around the country. And I'm a member. So you pay a membership fee, it's like $200 annually and everything's run through the app. So when I wanna see the doctor, I can just hit it and I can book an appointment in person, telemedicine, whatever it ha- happens to be. Super simple, super easy. I don't have to f- sign anything when I get there. Um, and they're a great example of someone that's really embracing Hmm. this trend. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for going into that. So it seems like people do a good job on the front. If they're doing a good job on the front end with the kind of the evaluation part and they have all the content by the time if you can get in the same day, the, those, the credibility in in everything's already been built at that point. So they don't really care as much as, is, uh, is that. Yeah. And they, and if they are really good specialists, they may not get in the first day. In the same day, but they will have had communication with someone quickly and easily and have things booked and um, and done so in a way that is easy. Yeah. I want to get a little bit into the nitty gritty for a second, Pete, and talk about um, maybe on the B2C side, some of the things you actually do. And, and there was one with the... Um, the ABA. I'd love for you to talk about that. Sure. So um, because of a lot of the private equity, that money that's sloshing around in healthcare, um, about 40% of our clients are private equity backed. Um, So in private equity backed practices, uh, they have, they have to grow organically, you know, same store sales, if you will. Um, and then they'll grow through acquisition as well. And so we operate on the organic side of things is help them get more patients, you know, um, and, or when they're opening up new locations, help them fill the provider's dance cards as quickly as possible. So a good example of that would be a ABA uh, provider. So ABA is essentially autism therapy um, for kids and adults with autism. Um, 
very much a cottage industry. I have a son who's autistic. So we've been consumers of ABA therapy um, for a number of years. Um, and so that over the last two years has been an area we've, I think we've worked with five different ABA companies around the country. But this They're one close and personal to your heart. Also. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, they do great work. Um, so one organization in particular that is private equity backed, um, I believe they had, they had nine locations when we started with them. Um, they really weren't doing anything digital. Um, and what they were doing was not very good. And so we help lay out a strategy where we can help them figure out before they even open a location to determine the demand in that geography and determine and develop performance for them to say, hey, if you do move, you know, sign a lease and open up in this location, um, you know, here's a budget of if you invest X, you should expect Y in terms of number of inquiries. And, and then based on their historical data, figure out how many of those inquiries convert to actual patients. And then you multiply that by revenue and, and essentially can perform everything out. So by doing that, we're able to help them grow from nine locations to over 60 locations in about two years. Wow. Um, and today about 75% of their patients all come in through our digital programs, which reinforces the whole idea that referral is always going to be a strong component of how patients come in. You know, some practices more than others. Um, but the fact that 75% of their patients are coming in through digital programs um, illustrates the, the importance of patient choice, you know, today. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, anyone would like to see a crystal ball into hey, if we were to open this location, how successful is it going to be? And, and then have the um, means to actually execute on it. Yeah, it's well, and there's a saying that medicine is local. So every, every market is different. You know, uh, the, comp the competition, the number of competitors, um, the types of competitors to the payer environment, to the demographics and so on and so forth. So it's not an exact science, but the good news is if you're collecting the right information, historical information on how things are operating with other locations, um, you can model things out hmm. um, with some accuracy. Um, and, and I, and, you know, it's funny when, when you're working with someone who moves from nine to 60, locations and they're all different parts of the country. Um, you know, I would say that we were on target probably 90% of the time, you know, where we, we predicted outcomes in terms of, okay, you should expect a certain number of inquiries, you know, in a certain amount of time. Um, and then there are markets, there were a couple markets, maybe 10% of the markets where it's a bit of a grind because the competitive landscape or some other variables are making it challenging. And then that's, you know, that's where we have to really put our work in. What tends to, when you look at that, what is on the challenge side? So I could see there's competitors. What else do you look at as, is um, that would make it challenging to open up a location somewhere? Yeah. So, um, so competition, there's a lot of levels of that, you know, is the competition a dominant health system? Um, is there, um, is there uh, traditional, you know, there's like um, Indianapolis, for example. Uh, another issue is primary care doctors, which are oftentimes chief referrers to specialists. In Indianapolis, there are very few independents left. Almost everyone is employed by one of four health systems. So that creates a challenge. They're going to refer within their health system. 
they're going to refer within their health system. And so that could be a totally different challenge. And so there are data products out there like Definitive Healthcare and some others where you can assess markets before you go in and know like how many primary care doctors are there or practices and are they independent or, or are they owned? And then who are they referring to and for what and what volume? So being able to do assessments like that in markets is really helpful. Um, and that's kind of where it begins. And then we start drilling into, okay, for example, on Google, you can, you can determine, it'll tell you how many people are doing searches for ABA therapy or ABA therapy companies in a 10 mile radius of a specific location. And what's that cost per click and so on and so forth. Hmm. Um, so there's um, different levels of information that we would be looking at um, to help determine, A, is it a location they want to move into? And B, what's it going to take to be uh, fill the dance cards once you're there? I want to switch gears, Pete, for a second and, and talk about the business itself and what's been helpful to grow the business. And I don't know, you know, before we hit record, I don't know if you said this in jest, but starting the business at a kitchen table um, and then growing from there, what's been successful in growing. And one of the things you said was about um, getting out of the way. So I wanted you just go into what that means. Yeah, I, I call it the, the entrepreneurial dilemma. Um, there's lots of business books that talk about, you know, hiring the right people, you know, filling the right seats on the bus, you know, type of analogy. What they don't talk about a lot is getting out of the way that the entrepreneur know how to and when to get, you know, it's not just hiring the right people. It's then also getting out of their way to let them do their jobs. And, um, and there's for, and in talking with other entrepreneurs who've been through this, um, there's, it's emotional. You're used to being in there, diving in there, you know, rolling up the sleeves, getting dirty, fixing things. Um, but as you grow and you expand the team and you're hiring professionals, that's what they're there for. And the reality is they can, I, and I'll say this for myself, uh, the people that I've hired do, do their jobs better than I could um, by design, but it is hard to just get out of the way and let them uh, do their thing. And since I've done that um, this year, it was mid-year um, that I, <laughs> I, my COO and I had the big talk and, and I stepped away, went on vacation it was wonderful. I was able for the first time to go on vacation and not be working for hours every morning. Um, so it's been a, it's been a game changer, but I still screw up sometimes <laughs> and get in people's way, but, um, but it's, um, it's definitely, uh, definitely a challenge for entrepreneurs. So how can someone, if they're listening, step into that, if they've, you know, it's something they're struggling with or something they've thought about stepping into. What, what's the first step you recommend? Well, I think the first step is obviously, you know, yes, hiring the right people for right seats to the bus, hiring real pros who really know what they're doing. Um, and then A, B, have ongoing communication with them about where the boundaries are. And just in my case, and I'll speak to my case, I just admit to them, look, I, I'm used to doing a lot of different jobs. Um, I'm used to doing your job. Um, tell me if I'm mm. interfering. Yeah. Uh, tell me, you know. <laughs> so basically you know, give them authority off. to say back off. That's exactly because it. Because if you don't give them that authority, they'll just be like, oh, I guess maybe they'll just roll with it. Exactly. And, and, you know, as things kind of grow and then people are under them and so forth, you know, I've learned that um, by not backing off, not letting them do their jobs, it actually, it um, circumvents their authority uh, yeah. to do their job and also support their people. 
Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So give them authority to say back off. Let me do yes. my thing. Okay, cool. Yes. Um, when I think about what you do, I'm sure you have a lot of complimentary partners. Um, cause you do certain things, your partners do certain things. And, and again, you mentioned, um, like a neurosurgeon. I wanted you to talk a little bit about the ecosystem a little bit. Yeah, I would say, you know, the, there's definitely an ecosystem in healthcare. You know, it starts with actually there's a, a fellow named Scott Becker who's um, lives near me uh, here in Chicago. Um, he had started a company. He's actually an attorney. Um, uh, it was, I believe, the head of the healthcare practice, McGuire Woods, you know, for years and still with them. And he had started a newsletter uh, for owners and operators of surgery centers 20 years ago. That just grew, and then it became, they started doing conferences and trade shows, and now they, you know, Be Becker's uh, Healthcare Review, for example, overtook Modern Healthcare um, as the leading business magazine years ago, um, and he has grown. I mean, and it truly is an ecosystem, and so particularly on the B two B side, um, their conferences really are are the leaders and the, and great people. Um, they're all here in Chicago, which I think has really helped Chicago. And Nashville is obviously another major hub for health, the business of healthcare. But Chicago really ha is a is a big major hub here, not just because of Becker's, but but also because a lot of the trade associations like the AMA and folks like that are all based here as well, and a lot of conferences are here. Um, so I'd say that's like macro, and then micro would be companies that are complementary to what we do. So for example, uh, Raider 8 is a company that um, will refer in to manage online reputation management. So those Google reviews and vitals and health grades and so forth. Um, and yes, yeah, so there's another person uh, 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 at a company called Calidus Health that's out of Madison that uh, founded by a uh, Ganesh who's a uh, Duke trained neurosurgeon who then uh, broke his parents' heart by not practicing medicine and going into technology. And uh, so we bring them in when, for example, we're doing our programs and we see that, um, you know, 30% of the phone calls weren't being answered <laughs> by, by the staff, Huge right? Problem. That's missed opportunity. And so he'll come in and provide after hours call you know, overflow calling, uh, workflow automation, you know, it gets into that patient engagement, making it easy for people to do business with these practices. Um, so wide variety of folks that we work with, but yeah, those would be some of you. Love it. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I have one last question, Pete, and I just, before I ask it, I want to point people to learn more, check out more and um, people can go to ehmresults.com. Are there any other places online we should point people towards? Well, EH, yeah, ehmresults.com is Volve Healthcare Marketing. Um, and then we also own something called the American Healthcare Journal um, that is a leading source of business and public policy um, news and information um, for the healthcare industry. Um, so we have members of Congress, Senate, um, disease, uh, CEOs of disease societies, all write, writing op-eds and various things uh, on a regular basis uh, with the publication. Where can people learn more about that? Is there a certain um, website Ameri or place only? Uh, AmericanHealthcareJournal.com. Got it. Perfect. So last question. So yeah, check out ehmresults.com. Mm -hmm. Check out AmericanHealthCareJournal.com to learn more. Um, you know, a lot of these these things, these companies and in, in healthcare places you work with are near and dear to your heart. We mentioned earlier. Um, I like to talk a little about you started a charity. Why you started the charity, and and a little bit about that on the personal side. Uh, sure. So you know, one of my reasons for having strong interest in working with uh, within healthcare and then in particular um, with healthcare good healthcare providers is you know I have three children um, and uh, two of which have had special needs and uh, so one uh, the daughter 
uh, had a chronic form of epilepsy and, um, you know, she passed away at the age of three. Mm. Um, sorry. And that, oh, thank you. And, you know, from there, we, um, we, had, my wife and I, sorry, my dog uh, is barking here. Um, my wife and I had started a, a foundation a number of years ago, um, a tri- pediatric epilepsy foundation, um, you know, to help give money to organizations that were supporting families with chronic, uh, children with chronic forms of epilepsy. Um, and, uh, but from on the professional side, um, that is, you know, uh, what helped drive my interest in working with really good healthcare providers. The idea being that, um, these providers, you know, if we can help them grow their practices, um, increase the number of patients, grow their practices, it enables them to hire up additional great providers and expand their capacity to serve. Pete, as a, um, you know, your son being autistic, have you seen the changes in, in care over the years? Specific to autism? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I would say, you know, ABA therapy in particular, a lot of changes. Um, it used to be that um, ABA was a carve out in many cases with self-insured companies, plans um, deemed experimental. So they wouldn't pay for ABA therapy and some related therapies. That since has changed. And so that's in a big way has driven um, much of the growth of that industry and also a lot of the private equity investment that's been happening the last couple of years. I feel like the diagnosis in general has changed as well. And I don't know if that's because of the different therapies that have come out or different treatments, but I feel like that has changed a lot. And the awareness, I don't know, maybe it's just me paying attention to it, but I feel like I've been more aware of it in general. There is definitely more awareness. Um, and I would say that also, and I'm not, not an ABA expert, expert per se, um, but they've also changed the diagnosis a bit. So they just call it being on the spectrum because people would talk about autism versus Asperger's versus this versus that. Um, now they just call it being on the spectrum and, um, and it encompasses a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, Pete, first of all, I just want to thank you. Thanks for sharing your journey, your story, your knowledge. I want to point people towards your websites, uh, you know, ehmresults.com and americanhealthcarejournal.com to learn more, check out more episodes of inspiredinsider.com. And I just want to be the first one to thank you. And thank you. Really appreciate it. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out. Peaches